what they call your personal mythology or the stories or beliefs that you tell yourself about the world that help guide your actions, your thoughts, and your behaviors. And the idea is that discovering conflict in your life, whatever way that manifests, is a signaling that something in your personal mythology or something in your way that you, the story that you have about your reality and your world is off and needs changing. And the idea is that a lot of our personal mythology we have developed out of experiences that we've had as children in our childhood and the way that we interpreted those experiences to deal with the world and what we tell ourselves about the world in order to interact with it. And that the mythology or the stories that children tell are different than what serves an adult later on in life. And without really taking the opportunity, having an introspective look and figuring out what those stories are, we don't ever really get the opportunity to see how they're playing into our lives, how they're affecting us, how they're affecting other people. So it's broken down into five stages, and it's based off of the um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis um, way of looking at sort of philosophy. And so the first uh, couple stages are about looking at something in your life that you'd like to change, something that happened to you and caused you to view the world in a certain way that is no longer serving you any longer. It's depleting your energy, it's not giving you passion for life, it's whatever it's doing causing this conflict. Deciding, they call that your old myth, and then looking at and developing what's called a counter myth, which is often the opposite of what you've been living with, which has also played itself out in your life. And then you want to take those two because both have limitations and both have benefits. And you want to synthesize the best of both into a third mythology that you then, using the fourth and fifth stages, commit to living into your daily life. And a lot of programs that are incorporate this kind of work usually stop at about the third stage and they don't actually get you to commit to making the change. This can all be well and good, and there's always benefit to doing it, but unless you actually commit to making the change, then no change will really come out of it. So I'm gonna do kind of a brief overview of each of these stages, hopefully giving you guys some ideas. If something that I mentioned really resonates with you, definitely by all means go home and try it, or if you wanna to talk to me further about it. The program brings together many, many years of research into psychology, um, sociology, kind of the way people work, how their mind works, and incorporates the program into maybe different ways of looking at it than you normally would have. So there's rituals, there are guided MP3s that take you on inner meditations that allow you to meet your inner shaman, um, to feel what emotions have um, played into, into your body, into your subtle body, um, making lists, making contracts. So it pulls on a whole bunch of different aspects to kind of bring together this one program. So I'm just gonna give a kind of brief overview of all of these and hopefully give you guys some tools. So the first stage is understanding the underlying mythic conflict, and this one starts with taking an examination of the mythology that your parents and your grandparents lived with. So myths of generation past. And this, the stories that your parents and your grandparents told about their world most certainly have an impact on you because they're the ones that taught you for the most early parts of your life. And we're at a very unique stage in human history in that never before has the mythology of our previous generations, of our parents, of our grandparents, become so rapidly op obsolete and not function properly as a guiding mythology with the massive amounts of advertising and the ease of information access with the internet. It's just been a total barrage of the senses for us. And so it's calling forth this need to really examine what we're living with as our own personal mythology. They also, so they get you to ask them questions about your parents and your grandparents, like how they understood their role in society, 
what gave them sources of satisfaction, that kind of thing. And the idea is that when you kind of get a grasp of what you want to accomplish before you die, as you kind of get a grasp of what guided your parents and your grandparents, you can see how it influences you today. Uh, they also have meeting your inner shaman, and this is a term that they kind of use to going within and finding your own inner wisdom, and they kind of portray that as a shaman. It can be however it comes out in your own imagination, but kind of getting you to turn in and find that own inner source of knowledge that you have and wisdom that can help guide you. And then they start you getting into your shifting mythology, so kind of looking at how your mythology has changed over the years. What things did you think when you were a kid or a youth or a teenager that are different now? What changes have you been looking at? And they get you to make a personal shield, which is broken into five sections, and each section has a symbol. The first stage is for paradise. So you find a time in your childhood that really represents your paradise, where the world was your playground, you know, you never had to worry about anything, everything was taken care of, your kind of paradise version of the world. And then the second symbol is your paradise lost, so maybe it was a betrayal, or sometimes somebody lied to you, or something of that nature that kind of made you turn around and go, that's really strange, I th the world's not the way I thought it was. Why would somebody hurt me in this way? And then the third symbol is your paradise regained, which represents the stories that you now tell yourself to help you deal with that experience. So one example here might be the paradise lost uh, little girl is playing hide and go seek with her friends and she gets left out there and her friends don't tell her that the game's over and they all just go in and she gets really upset about this. How could somebody do this? How could they betray me? I'm never going to do this to anybody because I hate how this feels and I'm always going to be there for people and always make sure that you know I never upset anybody. Okay, so that's the mythology that they now have guiding them, but that's not always necessarily the best way to do it. Um, so that's just an example. And then another symbol is your quest, sort of a representation of what you're here to do. And then the final symbol you make at the very end that kind of culminates all of the work that you did into your game vision of what you're moving forward to. So getting into symbolism, drawing symbols, trying to think about this and bring up, oh, what does my old myth represent to me? How, what is a symbol that can um, sort of encapsulate that whole mythology? Um, and then you can start assessing your mythic conflicts. So you can start a conflict survey where you start listing things, uh, behaviors, feelings, symbols that you feel are causing some conflict in your life. And then just kind of getting some ideas out there. Maybe I'm finding myself always late for work, or um, I always drop everything that I'm doing when somebody else asks me to do something. Those kind of things. And then finding the roots of where that conflict came from. So there's some really great MP3s. If you guys are interested in any of them, they can take you back to childhood memories to figure out where these sort of things came from and then help you to work through some of them and rewrite them. The second stage is understanding both sides of the conflict. So you have your myth and your counter myth by this point, and now you're writing a fairy tale. And a fairy tale is a fairy tale that represents your life. And this is a really amazing exercise to do. It gives you an opportunity to kind of take a step back and look at your life objectively and symbolically as sort of an archetype myth that has been played out over the centuries and millennia that human beings have been here. And then you go, oh, you know what? This is nothing new. This is always happening. I can learn from this. I don't have to take it so seriously. And in conjunction with that, we did a free writing exercise. This is fantastic. I highly suggest you give this a shot. Basically, all you do is you sit down. It's a nice way to start your morning off, and you just write and you write and write and write for five minutes, the only rule is that you cannot stop writing. And it can be whatever comes out, I don't know what I'm doing, this is such a stupid exercise, I can't believe Matt got me to do this, I can't believe I'm sitting here doing this, whatever it is. And then read it after and see what comes out. You'd be really surprised with what can come out, but the only rule is you can't stop writing. Uh, and then there's a couple exercises that are really great guided uh, visualizations of healing an ancient wound and saying goodbye to an antiquated myth. Um, they, use, they adapt the um, five stages of 
bereavement process where you um, say things that you're taking with you, things that you're appreciative for, things that you're letting go of, and giving gratitude for what you've learned from it. Because the idea is that you're not turning this old myth that is no longer serving you into the enemy, into a negative thing. It's not a positive and negative myth. There's good things from both, and recognizing that what you have gotten you so far has gotten you to this point, so it has served a purpose. It's not the enemy or anything like that, and kind of working with it and moving past it, evolving it to the next stage. And then also finding roots of mythic renewal, so going in and finding um, experiences that have your counter myth in it, and because what you're trying to bring in already exists in your life, it's just trying to find where it's come out and bring more of it into it. And then the body metaphor of conflict gets you to hold both myths in your hand and kind of feel the energy, so this is kind of adapting it into your subtle body, uh, whatever you want to call that, but the idea is that your body stores memories and emotions and experiences and kind of getting a feel for that and working with it, identifying colors, feelings, that sort of thing with it. The third stage, you start to envision a new mythology, so you've got both sides of it, and then you go, what is the best? of both and how am I going to live forward with it. <clears throat> so you come up with mottos for each of your myth and then you list your actions, thoughts, feelings and behaviors. This is a great exercise to do too. So if you have, um, maybe you're working on procrastination or something like you want to be more proactive with your work so you can write down your actions, thoughts, feelings and behaviors that have played in over the past few hours, over the past few days, over the past few years and then just make a list of those and keep that list going for a week and kind of see, just really start, it's to get you to put your awareness on those thought patterns or those behaviors as they come up. So all of a sudden, you catch yourself going, oh, I can do it tomorrow. Oh, well, wait a second, I'm trying to work and be more proactive with this. What am I doing now? I have more time to do this now. Um, bringing your conflicting myths into dialogue. This is really, really interesting. There is a lot of positive feedback from this one. You have your two myths that you're working with, you give a name, you characterize both of them, and then you have them talk to each other. Kind of the Lord of the Rings Gollum thing where he's talking back and forth. So this kind of depersonalize it, and you can look at it as sort of these sub-personalities inside you and see what are they competing about? What are they, where are they in conflict? How can you resolve this conflict and get them working together within yourself? And then, a body metaphor of resolution is the same thing as the conflict, but you're getting the two energies to synergize. So, not only in your mind, but also in your body. Resolution fantasy, you come up with symbols for both of them, and act out this play where they're interacting as conflict and then working together. So the whole idea is to kind of get the two myths working together and moving forward with the best of both of them. The fourth stage goes from vision to commitment. Uh, this exercise is for going back and um, you, you make a bridge and go back to a childhood memory and then uh, bring in everybody that was around there and then you yourself as your adult form come in you can talk to your childhood self and tell them things that they needed to know and help them through this and it really is an emotional release, it really helps um, rework and reprogram some of the experiences that we've been holding on to. Uh, consulting your power object, so you can go out in nature and find something that draws you to it, maybe it's a stone or a leaf or a piece of bark or something like that, and really kind of studying it and looking at it and asking it, what does it have to teach you about your life and your mythology and your place, and kind of looking to nature and getting the wisdom out of nature in that way. Part three of your fairy tale helps you extend your fairy tale further into the future so that you can kind of see where it's going to lead you and get you kind of motivated to want to really live it. And then completing your personal shield was the um, vision we gained, or the a renewed vision that encapsulates everything you've done up to this point. And the fifth stage, living from your new mythology. Uh, invoking your new myth in your subtle body so you get into a position that you feel or a posture that you feel represents your new myth and really feel it, breathe it in, bring it in, and uh, put it into your subtle body. These ones are really excellent exercises you can do as well, even if you're not going through the program. Self-talk that supports your new myth. So, um, 
turning in and looking at what sort of self-talk you have, so the voice in your head that's going, oh, I can put this off, you know, tomorrow's a better day, that sort of thing. Identifying those comments that come up and then replacing them with the ones that you want to replace them with. So there's a couple techniques that they mentioned for this. One is thought stopping and the other is temporal tap. And before you do that, they want you to, has anybody heard of mnemonics? Mnemonics. Mnemonics, okay, yeah. So basically what it is, it, it works really well for remembering names. When somebody tells you something you want to remember, you associate a quality with that item that you want to remember. So if it's somebody's name, let's say their name is Tony, and you look at them and you see them on the front of a box of Frosted, or, uh, frosted Flakes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, Frosted Flakes. Tony the Tiger. Okay, so you picture them as Tony the Tiger, and then when you see them, you picture them on the box of the cereal, and oh yeah, it's Tony. <laughs> so it's, it's to link up thoughts in your mind so that you have better recollection of them in the future. So the idea is that you find this thought pattern that you want to replace in your head, the thought pattern that's saying, tomorrow's a better day. You know, I can start tomorrow. And then you associate it with a quality that is extremely grotesque. It can be a, a smell or a sound or uh, an image or anything like that. So that way, when that comes up, so does that. So you think of, oh, tomorrow's a better day. Um, I don't know, big like pile of sewage or something like that. And just exaggerate it, make it the most <laughs> awful thing ever. And then when that thought pattern comes up, oh, so is the sewage. Oh yeah, that was what I was trying to remember to catch whenever I thought. And then you can use the technique of thought stopping or temporal tap. Thought stopping, stop what you're doing. You can close your eyes. Breathe out the thought that you just had and then breathe in the one that you're trying to replace it with. So maybe you're trying to replace it with something of what is the best use of my time? So I can breathe out that tomorrow is a better day. What's the best use of my time right now? Maybe that is the best use of your time. And then the temporal tap uh, is a technique where you um, tap on the left side of your head in a semicircle around your ear and the same thing on the right side, repeating the new thought pattern to yourself, and the idea is that the, uh, the tapping interrupts your normal uh, filters that your brain goes through, and then it kind of gets that reprogramming right into your brain. Uh, and then they suggest a behavior rehearsal, a daily personal ritual, and a public ritual. So this is getting you to practice your new myth now, and the behavior rehearsal, you can act out a skit. Maybe there's a situation in the future that you find yourself um, maybe it's going to be a challenge to live from your new mythology so you can kind of act it out in your mind, say what you're going to say, um, picture yourself, you know, telling somebody your opinion when it's in disagreement to what they're saying because you are not trying to avoid conflict anymore like you have been all the time. And then a daily personal ritual, so something that you can do every day that helps you to remember the new mythology that you're living from. So maybe you're going to put post-it notes around on your bathroom mirror that remind you of what you're trying to do, keeping you inspired to stay on that path. And then a public ritual, anything that you're trying to do, if you make it public, if you tell people you're doing it, if you put it out there, if you write it down, it's going to get you to commit to it more because it's out there and, oh yeah, I told my friend that I'm going to do this, i got to do it, otherwise they're going to call me on it. List of reinforcers, this is listing internal and external influences on your life in the environment, maybe the people that you associate with. If the people are always holding you in this thing that you're trying to change, then maybe they're not the people that you want to be around. And identifying what those internal and external influences are and how you can kind of change them to help support the new mythology that you're bringing in. And then the final one was in a contract for living your new mythology. So that involves getting an accountability buddy somebody that you can talk to, meet on a week-to-week -week basis, and balance ideas back and forth with them, set goals for yourself, set something once a week that pushes your comfort zone that is gonna get you out of the box trying to do something new and challenge your basic uh, way that you live. So, And then also being specific with those goals. When you set goals, you wanna be very specific so that you can measure your success afterwards. 
And also, you want to be saying who you're doing it with, when you're doing it, where you're doing it, so that way, yes, that's when I'm doing it. And also attainable, because when you set yourself up for success, you're more likely to set yourself up for success in the future. Every time you say you're going to do something and then don't do it, you give power to that voice that is saying not to do it. So make sure you're attainable and also challenging as well for you because you don't want to get bored with it. And these are kind of some overall uh, suggestions that I've kind of come up with over the past few weeks of doing these is to have a loving attitude. Um, you know, be easy on yourself. You are absolutely perfect the way that you are. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing wrong with you. But if you're looking to make changes, just remember that. Um, forgiveness. Forgive yourself. We all make mistakes. It happens. We're human beings. We're not always in alignment with our values or the path that we want to be on. Um, my experience in my own life is it feels like I kind of go up here and then I go down here and then I go up here, but. You know, every time I'm where I want to be, I'm there for a little bit longer. And then I might fall off a little bit and then get back on. But every time I get a little bit longer, so forgive yourself. It's all right. Uh, open mind and an open heart. Be open to feedback. Um, that also um, goes in line with asking for help. If you guys aren't sure what's going on, I talk to people who are, you know what, I'm totally fine. There's nothing wrong with me. Talk to the people that you know. Talk to the people that know you that are close. Have a frank, open conversation with them because so often we don't do this. And if they're in the same state for some feedback as well, it can be a really incredible growing opportunity, learning opportunity, um, moving past the ego opportunity to really sit and receive that feedback that somebody has for you. Um, take an observer or experimental attitude. When you do that, it just makes it so much easier, you know? I, oh, I wonder how my life's gonna be if I start living with this belief. Well, try it. See how it goes. If you don't like it, change it. If you don't like it, change it. See what works. Take that experimental attitude. Stay inspired. Um, I remember a really great line from Tony Robbins. He said that people will change for two reasons. One is they hit absolute rock bottom, and two is by staying inspired. Because if you're comfortable, you're comfortable and you're not going to want to change. That's the most important thing about all of this is that you have to want to change. Because once you've decided that you want to, there's no stopping you. Ask for help. There's lots of people around you can ask for help. Again, that ties into um, getting critical feedback, trying to maintain that attitude of always being open to that feedback. Um, the facts of psychological life is that this Personal mythology idea, your mythology is constantly changing. It's always evolving. You could do this program and then finish it and then pick it up right again and have a completely new thing that you can work on. It always changes. So just keep that in mind and ties into the sort of experimental attitude. And then um, create a supportive environment. So what does your room look like? What does your living space look like? Do you have people in your life that are going to help you and support you and that kind of thing? Uh, so a couple of things that I'm doing on Monday, June the 4th at the area, I'm giving a talk on secret economics and how we can create an economy and live from an economy that is more in line with the ecology of the planet so that we can move through this maturation process of the human race that is going on right now and move into a more adult, loving, co-creative partnership with Mother Earth rather than a receiving child-like state that we've been in and turning our gifts toward their true purpose. So I'm going to be doing that at the area on the June 4th. Um, you can check out my blog and podcast at matrixevolution.wordpress.com. I'm also doing a fundraising campaign I talked about on Friday to try to go down to Peru and help give back to a few Peruvian communities with sacred economics and gifting and um, permaculture. And that's about it. Thanks, guys. Yes. Yeah. I hope that made sense. Does anyone have any questions? Okay.
a lot of a lot of stuff I know. But if anybody wants to talk to me about any of this, by all means, do. Uh, up next we have Ben with transhumanism.